I am going to talk to you about something that's um, related to uh, the kind of mathematics I do as a faculty member at Imperial, um, but partly because of the audience composition, I want to talk about questions that were open and unsolved, so that if you are thinking about um, mathematics at all for pleasure, the kind of things the kind of questions that you may be able to answer or help answer in the future, as opposed to mathematics that's been solved. So I'm going to define all the words up here, but I just want to emphasize as we go through the talk that I'll be um, chatting quite a bit about open questions and unsolved questions. So at the end of this talk, hopefully you're more um, um, questioning than informed. <laughs> so as you can see from the title, I'm going to be speaking about knots and DNA. So a knot is just the kind that you tied in your shoelace, possibly before you came today, except for as a mathematician, we're going to require that you seal the ends together so the knot can't slip off the end. Um, these are uh, common objects. They've been found in a variety of settings. One very charming setting, actually, is Clifford Ashley's Book of Knots. So this was written... Um, uh, maybe 1940s by um, Clifford Ashley, this rather jaunty looking fellow on the cover is a stevedore and you see the knot he's holding in his hand. If you seal it up, then you get this picture on the right, which I've traced out for you called a stevedore's knot. So stevedores were the um, kind of swarthy large men on the docks that were responsible for loading and unloading barrels. And so anyone that spent time on boats, um, I was just lucky enough to be on a four-masted schooner in Maine, um, sees the incredible intricate knotwork that lays on the um, ships, um, on the um, ships. So this is a very special kind of knot that's very useful for raising and lowering barrels from the dock. So this is an example of a very practical knot, and the original interest in knots was this kind of pragmatic approach. So there's over 2,000 knots in this book. They're arranged by how to use them rather than any other mathematical considerations. So this is a picture of a 100-pound note um, um, from Scotland. And the man that you see on the left, although he looks similar to Darwin, is not. It's Lord Kelvin. Um, and Lord Kelvin, uh, he's buried next to... Um, in Westminster Abbey, uh, adjacent to Isaac Newton. He was knighted for his work on the transatlantic telegraph. He was knighted by Queen Victoria, becoming Sir William Thompson. He's a highly esteemed uh, British scientist. He's from Belfast originally and spent most of his career at the University of Glasgow. But he was, um, he was, he was prolific in a variety of um, subjects. But for us this evening, the interest is the fact that he became very interested in understanding molecules. And at that point, in the late 1800s, there was this idea that ether pervaded the air between you and me, for example. And the idea was that different elements, hydrogen, helium, carbon, would be uh, represented by different knots in the ether. So his original motivation for trying to understand knots was uh, chemical, to try and understand molecules. Um, so I like that there's kind of a historical tie between the life sciences and mathematics. So guided by his um, um, friend's <laughs> advice, um, Lord Kelvin encouraged uh, Peter Guthrie Tate to start tabulating knots. So just to draw out a table of all possible knots. And this is, this is the beginning of the table. You can see the um, pictures up in the top. And we'll talk about the numbers here. And just because it's a math talk, I just want to have, although the ratio of pictures to theorems and things will be very high, I just want to have a few things up. So we can say more properly what a knot is now that we see some images of them. And it's just a function going to a circle um, where the function is continuous. It's one-to-one, -one, so, and it has a continuous inverse. Um, so these are all examples of, of knots in three dimensions. There's no reason not to consider multiple knots at the same time. And when you do that, you get links. So here's some examples in gold and blue up above of two component links. That's what the superscript 2 means in these tables. And down below in these Mardi Gras colors, uh, you get um, three component links. This one right here is very famous. Has anyone seen it before? This one's 632. So the three means it's the three components. Six means that there's six crossings, one with purple, and two with purple and green, two with gold and green, and two with gold and purple. And two just means it's the second such knot in the table, the lowercase two. 
But these are called the Borromean rings. So if any of you are from Florence or have spent time in Florence, you will have seen them uh, emblazoned everywhere because they are part of the coat of arms of the Medici family. So um, in all the stonework and all of their fortresses and all of their palaces, in lots of their tapestries, um, they're ubiquitous. And they're um, kind of why would you have them as a family motto besides the fact that you know, they're beautiful. It's because if you take away any one of these, so for example, you remove the purple one, then the gold and green fall apart. So it's this idea of strength through unity, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so knots were tabulated and first kept char track of uh, in terms of these crossing numbers that we're alluding to before here. For example, the fact that there were six crossings all together here. In this example up here, there's two cross, uh, zero crossings. This one, there's two. This one, there's four, et cetera. So to be able to even tell whether or not a string is even knotted to begin with is a very difficult thing. So here's a picture of a um, piece of string kind of jumbled up and put down on the table. And the question is, is the string knotted or not? No pun intended. Shall we do mandatory voting? <laughs> mandatory democracy. So 50-50, you have 50-50 chance. That's pretty good odds. Knotted? How about this? Blink once if it's knotted. <laughs> it's hard to do it right in a public lecture talk. All right, blink twice if it's not. Oh, most of you are right. I'm, I'm, fact, I'm sure I just missaw the few others. It's, it's unknotted, but it's a very kind of tricky one. It was named after Morwen Thistlethwaite, the knot theorist that created this. And even though it has 15 crossings in this picture, it's actually exactly the same as this guy. That is to say, you could pick it up, give it a good shake, and it would actually unknot. So this one's unknotted as well. So this is just a very beautiful picture of an unknot. But it's a very deep question. Like I'm asking you something at the beginning of a popular math talk five minutes in, but it's a question that um, knot theorists haven't been able to come up with a perfect answer for. That is to say, if some very diabolical person in the audience takes a very long piece of string and wraps it around trillions and trillions of times and hands it to a knot theorist, a, per, a person like me who spends their life studying knots, it's not immediately clear how to determine whether or not it's knotted. Um, so it's a very deep question, although it's a very simply phrased one. So moreover, if I have two such knots, um, <coughs> Can you tell whether or not they're the same? That is to say, can you go from one to the other without cutting and resealing the strings? So here's a picture of um, on the left and on the right of two pieces of string. Are they the same or are they different? Yeah, good. I like that you all are becoming more confident as we go on. That's right, they're the same. They're two different pictures of this uh, first kind of non-trivial knot we saw in this table right here. This is called a trefoil, trough for three, foil for leaf, because it looks kind of like a three-leaf clover. Um, this next one down, five, is called a pentafoil, because it's got five leaves. Can you see kind of radially around? And there's the septafoil down there. OK, so these are two different pictures. What about this one? Same or different? I'm asking you really hard questions. And it's dinner time. Yeah, so these, these not theorists, so remember these tables were first done in the 1890s. Um, and these, these knots have 10 crossings, so they're not incredibly complicated. They're not billions of crossings. And until um, 1974, knot theorists thought that they were two distinct knots. They showed up in the tables. If we had continued the tables, the tables that uh, I showed you here, if we had continued this up to... Uh, 10 crossings, so this is showing us eight crossing knots. If we continued it up to 10 crossings, they would have been listed adjacent to each other as knot 10, 151 and knot 10, 152. Um, but uh, there was a lawyer named Ken Perko who, in his spare time, enjoyed doing knot theory as as, as one should. And he, he realized um, through um, both some luck but also some nice work, 
um, and showed that there are actually two different pictures of the same knot. Um, and so it was, he used to show up to conferences, like in a stretch limo with a sleek um, Gucci bag. <laughs> and so he's quite out of place at math conferences where, um, I'm sorry to say, we don't all go by stretch limo. But, but this became known um, as the Perco pair um, for this. And now, in, in, if you go look at a knot table online, if you just Google it or go to Wikipedia or something, you'll see that they're... Um, They've been amalgamated into the picture, the kind of standard picture, which is the one on the left. Okay, so you see that um, I'm actually not that nice because I'm asking you lots of very deep, hard math questions. And I haven't given you any tools yet besides just looking at the knot to be able to answer them. And so what, what we'll do now is look at some tools. So what we'd like is some tool, something we can assign to a picture of a knot. That could be a number, that could be a matrix, that could be a function or a polynomial, it could be a color, it could be something. And we want to assign it to a knot so that if I have a knot and this guy with the striped scarf in the front row has a knot and we, we calculate whatever this thing, thing, this number or whatever that we're each going to associate to them, if they turn out to be different, then we know we can't go from his knot to my knot without cutting and resealing the string. And so we're just going to look at a couple examples of how that might happen. So the, that number or polynomial or matrix or whatever, we're going to call it an invariant because it doesn't vary as long as you're gentle to the knot. You can stretch it, you can rotate it, you can slide it, you can um, you know, move it around in space. You can't, you can't be vicious to it, you can't cut it. Um, but as long as you're nice to it, um, you know, you, you, you can massage it, but you can't chop it. Uh, then then this, not, this thing, whatever it is, will not vary. So it's called an invariant. So here's uh, an example that you've already seen of an invariant, and that's what's called the minimal crossing number, which we'll abbreviate MCN. And it is, if you look at all possible pictures, which is a heroic task, but if you look at all possible pictures of your knot, you find the one with the smallest number of crossings, and that is what's the minimal crossing number. So we've seen many pictures now, but in particular, we've seen this picture of the unknot, and we've seen this picture of the unknot. This one has zero crossings, this one has 15, zero is less than 15, so the minimal crossing number is, so the minimal crossing number is zero. Oh, thank you. So, right, because you can't get smaller than zero, right? You can't have something with minimal crossing number minus one, right? We're just looking at the number of crossings, not the sign of them. Okay, so now we can look back at this knot table and understand the notation. So this zero here means that the minimal crossing number of our unknot is zero. The three here means that the minimal crossing number of our trefoil, our friend the trefoil, is three. The minimal crossing number of the pentafoil is five. But uh-oh, look, there's another knot that also has minimal crossing number five, right? And now it gets worse. Here's two knot, three knots now, each with minimal crossing number six. And they're just labeled six, one, six, two, six, three, because that's the order they show up in the tables. And life gets even worse. As you carry up, so here's the trefoil. There's only one of them with minimal crossing number three. There's three knots, as we just saw, with minimal crossing number six. But now, by the time we get to 16, there's almost 1.4 million uh, knots with minimal crossing number 16. So it's clear that minimal crossing number is not going to solve all of your problems. So you need to find something else. OK, let's, let's look at another invariant. So remember, we're going to assign something to our knot, our piece of string, such that it stays the same no matter how I pull it, stretch it, rotate it, whatever. So this is the unknotting number, which we'll call u for unknotting of our knot k. And it's the minimum number of crossings you need to change in order to change it into the unknot, in order to transform it into the unknot. So what do we mean by a crossing change? We mean taking something like this, breaking my arm uh, here, and then passing this one through. So we go like this, now close your eyes, to that. But, you know, actually straight through. So, or, or more, more sensibly, we go, here's one segment, here's a horizontal segment, so we cut, we pass the other one through, and we reseal. So the unknot has unknotting number, it's kind of a trick question, zero, right? Because you don't have to change any crossings to unknot it. The trefoil, on the other hand, is different from the unknot. We know that because the minimal crossing number of the trefoil is three, not zero. So we know that it's got to have a unknotting number of at least one. And voila, here's a picture of our trefoil. I've circled a little crossing in black here. 
If we do a crossing change on that, then we just get the unknot. Can you see that? Yes. So we just pull, so then this uh, vertical strand is now behind this one. So this is horizontal arc is laying on top of this uh, vertical little node, and it just flops down. You give it a good shake, and you just get the unknot. So that's good. The unknotting number seems helpful, right? It's told us that the trefoil is different from the unknot. However, <laughs> right, we've only started the talk, so we couldn't be done yet. However, the, there's another knot. Here's another knot. So this is a four-crossing knot. It has minimal crossing number four, but its unknotting number is also one. If you change any one of these one, two, three, four crossings, if you change any one of them, you also get the unknot. So the unknotting number is, is, is an invariant, but it's not a complete invariant. It still only gives you partial information. That is to say, the guy, I'm sorry, now on the second row, and I, if the striped scarf guy, if he had a figure eight knot, this four crossing knot here, and I had the trefoil up above, and someone said, all right, determine if they're the same or not using the unknotting number, we wouldn't be able to tell because they're not different, right? So just because the invariant is the same doesn't mean the knots are the same, right? The trefoil is definitely different from the figure eight knot, right? Because this has minimal crossing number three. This has minimal crossing number four. But you see that if you start to use a combination of these guys, then you may be able to realize um, whether or not two knots are the same or not, no pun intended. And so that's what this lawyer, Ken Perko, was able to do. He looked at um, dozens of these so-called knot invariants to try and... Um, find a combination of them that were um, different from one knot to the other. And when he went through and checked every single one of them, he saw that they were absolutely identical. And that's what made him suspicious. I mean, he's a lawyer, right? So he's reading the fine print. He goes through and sees it's absolutely identical all the way through. He says, it's strange that every single invariant we know, there's dozens, uh, is exactly the same for these two. And so that's what had him focus in on these two particular knots. Okay, so I've shown you how to calculate a knotting number for these kind of straightforward knots, the trefoil and the figure eight. But in general, it's not so easy to tell. I've shown you kind of their prettiest pictures, the pictures that, that realize the minimal crossing number. But here's another knot. This is a, a knot on the left with minimal crossing number 10. It's not one of the Perco pair, but it is a 10 crossing knot, a knot with minimal crossing number 10. In this picture over here, the kind of prettiest picture of this knot, you have to change four crossings to get it to the unknot. But now if you pick this piece of string up and you give it a shake and introduce some more crossings before setting it back down, I mean, just not by cutting and resealing, just by flopping around bits, then you have this guy. This picture has uh, 14 crossings, if you count them all. And in this picture, you only need to change two of them. So this, uh, even though this isn't the nicest picture of uh, the particular knot that we're looking at is the one that gives you the unknotting number, the one that helps you realize the minimal number of crossings you need to change over all possible projections. So it's a very, very subtle thing to understand what the unknotting number is of a given knot. It's not the kind of thing you want to have for homework. And I want to, maybe just as an illustration of this, uh, a good friend of mine who's at University of Glasgow, Brendan Owens, last year had a paper, um, actually two years ago now, had a paper on um, determining the unknotting number of seven different knots, right? We've just done it for two, actually three now, right? The trefoil, the figure eight knot, and this guy. Well, Brendan calculated it for seven. They were nine crossing knots, knots with minimal crossing number nine, knots with minimal crossing number 10. And uh, it took him a paper to do it in incredibly beautiful state-of-the-art three-manifold topology called Hagard Floor Homology, if there's any mathematicians in the audience. Anyway, it went to a fantastic journal. It's very technical. Most people would get lost in the introduction. It's very nicely written. But it had to use state-of-the-art techniques that weren't available five years ago in order to answer the unknotting number for these very small knots, nine, minimal crossing number nine, not 900, just nine. So I, I just want to emphasize how um, tricky determining some of these things can be. And, and so that kind of leads us to the holy grail of knot theory. Kind of, you know, if, uh, you know, if someone waved their magic wand at you and asked you what you wanted, knot theorists, if they were professionally minded, would ask for a complete invariant that's the same if and only if your original starting knots are the same. So remember, the unknotting number doesn't work because we had both the trefoil and the figure eight knot that had a knotting number equal to one. 
So that's not a complete invariant. Similarly, the minimal crossing number is not a complete invariant because we had three different six crossing, three different knots, six, one, six, two, six, three, that all had minimal crossing number six. So what we'd like is some super thing, some whatever, that was only the same when the knots were the same. And we'd like that thing not to be like the unknotting number, not the thing that requires like a 30-page paper published in a fancy journal by some guy that took him a year to do, um, to calculate them for knots with minimal crossing number nine. We want something that's reasonable. Um, and that's, that's been a big motivating question in this field that's driven the research forward since the beginning of the subject in the 1900s, early 1900s. Okay, so that's kind of the mathematical um, impetus for a lot of the research going on. But I want to talk to you about something um, that's a little different. So remember that I said that the field of knot theory started from these kind of chemical considerations, this association between knots and molecules. And, and, and that turned out to be wrong. Hopefully you know there's no ether anymore, and knots are um, not related to atoms. Um, but knots do show up in nature all the time. So this is an example of a hagfish. It's um, about a meter and a half in length. It exists, and it's, um, it's eaten in Japan, and it's fished, off the, it's fished in the Pacific Ocean. Actually, I have a friend who's a graduate student in San Francisco who's um, um, working on them um, as, a, as a food source. <laughs> um, but they're, um, they're kind of odd. They have multiple stomachs. They have multiple rows of teeth. But the reason we're looking at them today is um, they're called the slime eel or the hagfish. Neither one is very attractive sounding. And they're not um, very beautiful. But they, they um, get away from their enemies by becoming slippery. So they exude this kind of slime um, out. <coughs> and the, their, their predator uh, uh, can't hold on to them. Um, and so they... Um, so, so they get away, but then they begin to suffocate because the slime covers their... They don't have gills, but they have a primordial version of them. And so the slime suffocates them. So they need to get the slime off. How do you get the slime off? You squeeze it off. How do you do it if you're a long, skinny thing? You tie yourself in a knot near your head, and then you um, slip the knot down your body. And all that friction helps get off the slime. So there's movies... Um, I didn't think they were very appealing. So I didn't put them on, but there's movies. You can, if you've got an iPhone, you can zone out for a second and pull it up on YouTube, of these knots traveling down the length of one of these hagfish. So these knots show up in nature, um, but I think a much more appealing or at least beautiful place where they show up is in DNA. So don't worry, for those of you that haven't had A-level chemistry or molecular biology or wherever it's taught um, here, um, we're, we're, we're going to think about DNA in a very crude way. We're going to think about it essentially as a piece of string. But, but in the meantime, before we think about it like that, let's just understand what we're going to forget, which is the fact that it's actually a double helix, a, t a twisted staircase. So here's, these are four different images of it. Um, this is a space-filling image. This is a rendering. And this is an atomistic level. So it's a ladder. It's a twisted ladder. And the sides of the ladder are alternating sugar phosphate groups. And the rungs of the ladder are made of uh, two molecules that pair together. And they pair together always A with T or C with G so that you can read the uh, right hand version, right hand version, and get the corresponding left hand sequence. So you know this is... If this is C, this must be G. You know this is G, this must be C, etc. <coughs> and those, um, the DNA can be kept track of in terms of the number of rungs, or what are called base pairs, of this twisted ladder. So again, the ladder is twisted. Um, the sides form the famous double helix, um, one of the, a very famous uh, science book written by Jim Watson. Um, Okay, so it's a very long molecule. If we think about it in terms of these number of rungs, number of base pairs of this twisted ladder, for our own genomic DNA, the kind that we inherit from our parents, a mixture of our parents that determines all kinds of things about us, our eye color, our proclivity to various diseases, et cetera, um, it's about 3 billion of these base pairs. Um, for, ba for bacteria, E. coli, we get around 3 million base pairs. Okay, but we're going to look, we're going to now pretty much forget that slide for the rest of this talk, 
And what we're going to look at is kind of the imaginary axis of this twisted ladder. So this vertical line that I'm drawing right here that crashes through these hydrogen bonds holding these two uh, molecules together right here. So these, da these little dotted lines here are hydrogen bonds. So we're just going to imagine this imaginary line, and we're kind of going to throw away all the other structure of the DNA molecule. So here's a picture. Hopefully you can see the DNA axis here. I'm tracing out one backbone, one side of the ladder. This one's in red. And here's the other one. This one's in green. And what you see on this molecule, and I've drawn the axis in very thick black, what you see in this molecule is that the axis is not linear like it was on the preceding slide. Right? The axis here is just a little line segment going from the top of the screen to the bottom. Instead, the axis itself is circular. And below... These images down below are um, electron microscope images of uh, DNA molecules, very small DNA molecules. The DNA is, in is ensheathed in a, in a substance, a protein called Rec A, and then spread out. And what you see is that they're actually very small circles. So these are actual DNA molecules. One circle, here's another circle, here's another circle like this. Here's another circle. These also over here are also open circles. They just have a lot of extra crossings, like they're just um, like the thistlethwaite on knot. They're kind of mixed up. So these circular forms of DNA show up in lots of places. These bacteria, E. coli, the kind that live in your gut and your lower intestine, and the same kind that give you food poisoning of various sorts, um, the whole family of E. coli, they're genomic bacteria. They're, they're main, their main uh, DNA, their genomic DNA is circular. In plants, um, the chloroplast DNA, the molecule responsible for them being green, is circular. Uh, lots of viral DNA um, becomes circular. So there's lots of places where DNA becomes circular, so it shouldn't surprise you, given the introduction, that DNA can also become knotted or linked. Remember, a link is just multiple knots linked together or woven together. All you're seeing in this image is uh, the axis of the DNA molecule. And you see that, again, it's our friend, the trefoil. So this is also a trefoil. It's just got like a little, like its arm is just flopped over. One of the leaves is flopped over itself like that, but you can undo it without cutting. So it's been a big um, interest to the molecular biology community to try and understand what types of knots and links does DNA form. Does it form every possible one in the whole table? Is it only some of them? If some, which ones and why those ones? And so people have developed these imaging techniques like electron microscopy uh, uh, techniques to look at um, DNA molecules that are knotted and linked. But it's really hard to do. <laughs> it's expensive. It's time-consuming. Um, right now, there's one main lab um, in the world, Andre Stasiak's group in, in Lausanne, in Switzerland, that, that does it on a regular basis. Um, and all together in the entire published literature of DNA-protein interactions, of which there's hundreds of thousands of papers, there's maybe two dozen or three dozen published images like this. So, so, so it would be nice if, <laughs> you know, it would be nice if there was some other way to try and tell. Um, I think... So it's, it is difficult, it is time consuming, but I, I mean, one thing that you may be able to appreciate right away, depending on how well you can see this slide, is these guys, like, you can see the DNA molecule really nicely, but you can't really tell what it is. Like, you can see it's circular, but probably circular, but is it a trefoil? Is it a pentafoil? It's tricky to tell. So, <coughs> so there's been a big push to try and determine uh, what type of DNA knots can form, and to use alternative methods to try and understand that. So how are we going to do that? We're going to try and understand why they form and how they form, and maybe that will help us restrict what type of knots and links they form. So they form in lots of ways, and, <coughs> um, and I'll show you two right now, but we'll focus on the bottom one. So the first one is um, copying. So if you have a circular DNA molecule, so now I'm just drawing the axis of the DNA, so you can forget the slide with all the chemistry on it if it makes you unhappy. Remember that DNA is a ladder that's twisted. So by the way that DNA copies itself, DNA replication, then when it copies itself, then the um, two molecules, resulting molecules, after the replication process are actually linked together. In a, in a slightly more complicated way than I've drawn up here, but they're actually linked. 
So you can't separate the yellow and the blue rings here by a good shake or a stretch or a rotation or something. You actually need to cut one, do one of these crossing changes to get them apart. So, so this is one place, anytime you have circular DNA molecules, uh, you naturally get links uh, anytime they're copying. And in the lab, in um, a biochemistry or molecular biology lab, almost all of your DNA is circular. It's easier to work with for lots of reasons. So even outside of these occurrences in life, in vivo, in the lab in vitro, most DNA is circular. So, so DNA molecules become linked uh, almost all the time in the lab, unless you do something. The other place where DNA becomes knotted or linked is the thing that we're going to focus on for the last 10 minutes, which is uh, the idea of rearranging DNA molecules. So on the left is a circular DNA molecule. It's an unknot. It just has extra crossings. <coughs> when you do this action called recombination on it, which I'll describe in the next slide, you get out DNA knots and links. So here's some pictures of electron micrograph images of knotted DNA molecules. Okay, so we're going to just spend a couple minutes talking about recombination, and then we'll come back at the very end of the talk to more general DNA knots. But recombination gives us a nice example of how we can restrict the types of knots and links that, that come out by understanding the process uh, that, that, um, helps, uh, that causes them to arise. Okay, so recombination, as I just said, is just rearranging the DNA sequence. So, for example, taking Gattaca, remember, so that's the right-hand side of these base pairs. Oh, I completely lied. You have to remember that slide again. So, <laughs> remember that slide, G, C, T, A, blah, blah, blah. Thank you for nodding in the back. So, <clears throat> you're going to rearrange that. So, you're just, that happens in several different ways. So, that happens by inserting in a, a DNA segment into another DNA segment. So, here again, just like in the microscopy images, I'm just drawing the axis of the DNA. So here's our victim DNA here, and there's a little arrow showing where the, it's going to have something bad happen to it. Here's our predator DNA up here that's hovering up above. Um, there's some proteins, which we can think of as little molecular machines, that come along and will insert this uh, circular guy. We'll cut it here and then insert it into our victim over here. So can you see what happened? So you have a solid arrow here and a hollow arrow here. We've cut here. We've cut the hollow arrow there, and we've inserted this in between. Can you see that? Yeah. Or we can reverse the action. We can cut this guy out, so go the other direction. And I'm using this unpleasant terminology, victim and predator, because vi viruses, particularly viruses that infect bacteria, this is how they work. So there's a virus DNA sitting up here. There's an innocent little bacteria DNA molecule sitting down there, and it attacks its host um, in exactly this way. Okay, so that's one way they can rearrange, right? So instead of reading Gattaca as you go across this uh, uh, hollow arrow here, you go Gatta, blah, 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 ka, right? So that's one way where it's rearranged, or, or the reverse. The second thing, the second kind of large scale thing that can happen is you can have in between these two arrows where um, these proteins will attach to the DNA and cut it and reseal, you can have a sequence that becomes inverted. So in this picture over here, it's reading left to right. That's what those little arrows mean. And over here, it's reading right to left. So we've just taken, we've cut the silver, the hollow and solid arrows. We've inverted that segment and re-glued it back in. So those are the large scale reactions that can happen. And it just so happens <laughs> as a nice byproduct, if you're um, a mathematician, that this produces knots and links. Um, <clears throat> what, what we'd like to understand um, beyond understanding what types of knots and links we get out is kind of an atomic level movie of this process. Like I'm waving my hands here and drawing still images and nattering on, but what you'd like is to see the whole playing field. Like you'd like to see every single carbon atom, every single hydrogen bond. You'd like to see them breaking and then rejoining and moving around in space. And that's impossible. Like that's um, like the level of detail that you want is um, um, the lab techniques have not are nowhere near, unfortunately, understanding that. 
So instead, we'd like to um, develop other techniques. And I guess I should say for these recombinases, I mean, for this process, site-specific recombination, it's site-specific because it only happens where these little arrows are. This um, viral bit of DNA up here doesn't insert itself down here in this segment. It only inserts itself where it sees one of these arrows. I mean, beyond kind of the intellectual pursuit of understanding why uh, and how these uh, processes happen, the, there's been a lot of um, applied reasons for understanding it as well, in particular for genetically modifying crops um, or for uh, modifying organisms in the lab like mice and things like that to try and understand um, uh, a variety of things. So there are a very large tool in genetic engineering as well for both good and bad reasons. Okay, but for us, we'll stay with the um, more peaceful area of why it's interesting mathematically. And that is because if you start with circular DNA, here's a circular DNA molecule. These are all just plain circles, uh, just with varying degrees of extra crossings in them. You take a bunch of these guys, you throw in the little proteins that do the cutting at the hollow and solid arrows, and voila, you get out knots. So here's our friend the trefoil again. This is one of our friends, the 6-1 knot. And this is a combination. This is a knot that we haven't seen before. It's a new type of knot. It's gotten by kind of gluing together two trefoils. Okay, so you get out knots. So a question was, what types of knots and links do you get out? And the immediate answer is to look at uh, electron microscopy images of them. But for the reasons that I've already told you, it's been very difficult. And so knot theorists have developed um, tools um, to try and understand that. So I'll just give you an example of the kind of result that shows up. And this is work with um, a good friend of mine, Erica Flappen, which says that if you start on DNA molecules that look like this, so you have the solid arrow on this guy and the hollow arrow on this guy, you do recombination. You actually don't get any of the pictures that I showed you beforehand. You can only get out the unknot, you can get out the unlink of two components, or you can get out this guy. So this is just a link of, of two unknots. So it's just this guy um, right here like this. Those are the only things you can get out. You can't get out even our friend the trefoil, which means that in this picture, we didn't start with two links to get to here. We must have started with something else. So this has been a very useful thing biologically, and um, both for understanding what types of knots and links you get out, but also because understanding kind of what happens afterwards and knowing that you start with unlinks before helps you interpolate, helps you fill in the gap in between. So you kind of have static images uh, from the beginning of the process and at the end of the process, and now you fill it in. Like if you're um, turning, pa uh, you all maybe are too young for this, but did you guys ever have these um, flip books? You know, you start and it's like a little horse running or something, but it's like 25 pages, and each page, like a hoof is raised slightly higher and it's leaning slightly forward. And if you turn the pages really fast, then it looks like the horse is running. Do you know what I'm talking about? Thank you. There's one person that knows what I'm talking about. Good. So talk to the guy in the red shirt. He's all over this. Anyway, so that's what I'm saying. So, you, so you've got, because your eye fills in the details, right? It sees the, ho it sees the hoof in this position, then it sees it in that position, and it interpolates the whole movement there. So that's the similar kind of thing that biologists are doing. If you know the beginning configuration, that it started like this, and you know the ending configuration, well, maybe not exactly, but now you know it only has to be one of these three things as opposed to the whole world of knots and links, then it will help you determine what's happening where these kind of vague little arrows are, what's happening throughout the whole process. Okay, so <clears throat> that's why knots are interesting in the world of recombination, but in general, I want to say um, why they're interesting um, more broadly, and this is the subject we'll finish on in the next couple slides. So I think one example, one very nice example, is this the one that we just talked about, that if DNA, circular DNA copies itself, the resulting daughter molecules, they're always daughters, not sons, I don't know why, uh, are linked together like this. So imagine that you're a bacteria. Remember then, your DNA is circular. And suppose you're a bad bacteria, and you want to infect someone, you want to get them sick. <coughs> so what do you do? Somehow you get inside that organism, a person, say, and you then need to make lots of copies of yourself. Right? And the first stage in making lots of new bacterial cells is to make lots more bacterial DNA. So you begin copying your DNA. You copy your DNA like this, 
and you end up with linked things. And now you want the blue guy to go into a cell over here and the gold guy to go into a cell over there, but you can't do that, right? Because we know that uh, this guy has, for example, unlinking number one. You have to do a crossing change to get them into two separate cells. So it may not surprise you that in every organism so far studied, humans, cauliflower, mice, rats, monkeys, parakeets, whatever. There's a protein. Again, a protein for us will just be a mo small molecular machine whose sole function in the cell is to unknot and unlink DNA molecules. So here is uh, the equivalent of the gold and the blue guys before. So this is uh, the evil bacteria that's copied its own DNA. The DNA molecules are linked. This protein acts to unlink the DNA molecules. So that's its sole function in the cell. That's the only thing it does. It's very specialized. <clears throat> and perhaps unsurprisingly, if you kill that protein, then what do you think happens to the bacterial infection? Yeah, I, I thought it was a long question, so I didn't get like the Greek chorus. But, but what happens is you kill the protein, the molecules stay linked, and then not only can you not have new cells because the red can't separate from the blue anymore, but also the cell that you're in sees that they're trapped like that, and that's somehow not good. And so that cell... Um, uh, uh, undergoes apoptosis, um, programmed cell death. It commits suicide. Um, and, and that's the end of your bacteria infection. So if you've ever taken, if you've ever taken um, antibiotic drugs, antibiotics against bacteria drugs, then, <coughs> um, for example, the fluoroquinolones, such as ciproflaxin, if you guys have taken that, um, or Cipro or Leviquin, any amoxicillin is another very common one in the U.S. I'm not sure what's common over here. Um, then they work by killing this protein. Because once you kill the protein, then you um, stop the proliferation or the spread of this bacterial infection. So perhaps unsurprisingly, pharmaceutical companies are very, very, very interested in these proteins because, uh, because they're a very big target for antibiotics. And not just for antibiotics. Remember, we said that our own human DNA is not circular. It's linear. But it's linear in kind of an interesting way. It's stapled down at various points. Um, it's on this giant scaffolding, which means that if you tie a knot in some part of it, that you can't slide it off the end like the hagfish could. It gets trapped where the linear segment is stapled down. So <coughs> these um, proteins are in our cells as well. And if you develop cancer, one definition of cancer is uncontrollable cellular growth. Cellular growth before that can happen means that uh, uh, the DNA must be copied a lot. Um, and if you can't unknot or unlink the DNA molecules um, uh, in between these stapled down bits, then again, the cells can't divide and grow. And so they're also a very large target for um, chemotherapy drugs. So, so on multiple fronts, there's a lot of medical and pharmaceutical interest in understanding these proteins. So why are we talking about them? Well, one, because we know that they unknot and unlink DNA molecules. But two, because they haven't been solved. They ha there's lots of interesting open questions about them. And so just the last two slides, we'll just look at them. So one really interesting question is, is kind of highlighted by this image over here. So this is a very tightly wound circular molecule. And this blob at the end of it is our tiny little protein, our tiny little topoisomerase. It's very small compared to this, little, this molecule. This molecule is from the lab. It's 5,000 base pairs. Remember, bacterial DNA is on the order of 3 million base pairs. So it's absolutely minuscule compared to the DNA molecule itself. But it's somehow particularly clever in a way that has baffled biologists since these were discovered in the 80s. Um, because it goes around doing crossing changes, like the kind I talked about that we did. Um, and if you just do crossing changes randomly, you don't actually always get something less complicated. If you have the um, thistlethwaite unknot, the, the very messy unknot that I showed you at the beginning of the talk, if you start doing crossing changes on that guy, you can end up with something radical. And this can be proved. I mean, I'm waving my hands here, but it's a proof. But somehow, it always unknots, and it always unknots very efficiently. So this very small protein that can't kind of stand back like the sun and view the whole Earth all at once and see where in the DNA molecule it should start doing crossing changes, it somehow knows where to hone in to do it. 
And that's a very interesting open question, and it's caused, it's, it's kind of pollinated a very chimeric um, community of um, biologists, computer scientists, biochemists, uh, mathematicians, physicists, biophysicists, anyway, most of the sciences <laughs> of some sort or another, many teams working on trying to understand this process. Because not only does it understand which crossings it needs to change to unknot, it understands which crossings it needs to change most efficiently to unknot. In other words, to go back to the first part of our talk, it determines the unknotting number of these knots or links and hones in on like the key crossings in order to do it. So let's just look at an example to understand. So here's a five crossing knot. I put it in its minimal projection. It's not a hard knot, it's a nice, well-behaved knot. If you change this crossing right here, um, in the upper right, you get out the trefoil. If, however, you change this crossing down here in the kind of clasp region of the knot, then you get the unknot. So there were experiments done in Lynn Zedrick's group by Jennifer Mann and others that enabled, kind of crippled these proteins so they would only act once. So they fed this protein, this five crossing knot here, they let it act one time only, then they killed it, and then they looked at what they got out. What do you think they got out? Or maybe I said the answer, so, oh, good. If I said the answer on the slide, tell me, then I'll think you're really super smart. They got out all unknots like 99%, which in biology is 100%. So <laughs> they got out, it's true. <laughs> the rest is called experimental error. <laughs> so they, they got out 100%, approximately, uh, unknots over here. And so these, so these proteins did not only know which crossings to unknot, but which crossings to unknot most efficiently. So these incredible, powerful machines that people call the anti-kitten, because instead of taking a nice piece of string and tangling it up, they untangle it very nicely. And there's been many, many articles. If you just Google um, topo isomerase to unknotting, you'll see there's like a rich, currently I think there's six main theories out there for why they may possibly unknot or unlink. And various um, people are not invited to conferences if they're in the wrong camp. So I, I'm telling you that this is like a very exciting, interesting, a very contemporary area of, of mathematics and molecular biology to try and understand these kind of topological questions I started with at the beginning of the talk, um, but in a biological context. And just, I mean, so that you're not worried that we solve it all before you get your PhD or whatever, or you become a lawyer and solve it in your spare time, then I just want to show you that it's not as easy as this little five-crossing knot that I was showing you here. So this is an example of um, kinetoplast DNA. Here, um, this um, slide was taken from Michelle Klingbell's lab in Massachusetts, but um, it's the mitochondrial DNA from a parasite that causes uh, uh, African sleeping sickness, trypanosis. And I've blown up these regions right here, and I don't know how well you can see these slides, but it's like a chainmail armor. And so this guy, remember this is a parasite, it's a bad bug, it wants to infect someone and cause disease. So it needs to copy itself, and it needs to copy its mitochondrial DNA, and it needs to copy its kinetoplast DNA. And then at the end of that whole process, so when it copies itself, every single one of these little rings right here has another ring attached to it, linked to it. And when it's done copying and it wants to move into cells, every single one of those linkages need to be undone while all these other linkages of the original stay set, and you need two parallel copies that look identical, by the way. You can see them under electron microscopy um, that look exactly like this. So I'm showing you this image to show you, even though we've motivated this by looking at our friend the trefoil and it's very kind of nice small neighbors, biology is much messier. And so that's why this, has become, this is such a rich, rich problem. So maybe I'll just end by um, hope hoping that I've convinced you just a little bit that, that not through ubiquitous. I mean, if you go to the... Um, I was just in Oxford in the cemetery uh, <clears throat> just north of there. All the gravestones have Celtic knots on them. Very beautiful in there. So, but not just in, in um, human-created ones, but also in, in biology, and that they're important biologically, um, not just for academics, but also for companies working to manipulate DNA or to halt diseases. Um, and that maybe fortunately for us, us since you're at a math talk and not a biology talk, it's not yet possible to fully understand the implications and um, characterizations of these knots um, purely on biological terms. And so, <coughs> 
So mathematicians can help predict DNA knotting and in turn, hopefully, illuminate the biology and the biological processes involved. So here down below is uh, the stevedore's knot that I showed you at the very beginning of the talk from Clifford Ashley's book. In the middle is an electron microscope image of a DNA molecule in the form of a stevedore's knot. And just to like, leave you with a little something, I know I've said proteins are um, little molecular machines that do interesting things to DNA, but they're also long polymers. Long polymers? And here, just very recently, they discovered a stevedore's knot in a protein. So in the protein molecule itself. So there's like a whole new vista opening up, um, looking at knots in, in the microbiology world. So thanks very much for your attention and to the LMS Education Committee for inviting me to give this talk. And, and uh, in the meantime, there's some further reading if you're interested in, or if you've got an iPhone, you can download um, a knot guide. <laughs> thanks very much. Oh. Yes, in fact, many people do. That's a lovely, lovely um, question. So, if we, so let's just look back at what that excellent question just asked about. If we go back to our table of knots. So remember our friend the trefoil had these three leaves. That's why it was called a trefoil. So our friend the trefoil here, it's got this symmetry. Like if you put a, uh, if you pierce, don't worry, I won't do it, but if you pierce the screen, through the center of this trefoil. So you have an axis going like from the back to the front of the room and you spin it uh, uh, um, 120 degrees, um, then you get out exactly the same picture. So there's a symmetry in this knot. Um, similarly, if you look at its, its relative, the pentafoil, if you spin it by 360 divided by five, or here you spin this one, 360 divided by seven, you get the idea. Um, then, then it has a symmetry. So that's, that's uh, one example of the kind of um, symmetries that very astute questioner just asked about. But there's also lots of other um, symmetries in this. So there is a natural way to associate this idea of a group. So a group is a mathematical structure that likes to look at symmetries. Some of the nicest groups you can think of as symmetries of a square, like what happens when you rotate a square or reflect a square and do kind of compositions of those actions. Um, there's a very natural group that you associate it to it called the fundamental group, which, which does, in, in some cases, capture those symmetries. But, the, but it's a very rich field. And so there's a whole class of um, not theorists out there who I really think of as algebraists. <laughs> that is to say, they're never drawing really beautiful pictures of knots, or very rarely. They're just writing down lots of equations that come from group theory, from, from algebra. A very rich school of it, actually, here in the UK. So yes, there's a very rich interaction that would take 60 years to answer, or many people are still looking at. That's a great question. That was a good question. I'm impressed. I wonder how you ask a question after that.